So I think this this topic is very important for us in uh, uh, we were in uh, with human toxoplasmosis, given the several form we can see uh, in congenital toxoplasmosis, as uh, Dr. Magleo uh, she present very well all this problem of this disease. So uh, it's interesting to see that in 92, in 1992, uh, World Health Organization organized a meeting with a very prestigious names in the field of toxoplasma. And uh, at the same time, in 1993, was presented the first commercial vaccine. But this vaccine is for use in veterinar for veterinarians. So this is the aim of this uh, vaccine is to prevent abortion in sheep. But the question is why it has not been developed for human a vaccine. So it's possible to create a vaccine for human toxoplasmosis. And the second question we have is how far we are for a trial in humans. So it's inter important to see in another protozoal disease how is this current situation. So at the moment, the only uh, vaccine that is used in human for a parasite is the RTS for Plasmodium falciparum. Another vaccine for protozoa are used in veterinarian for use in veter uh, for veterinarian. But uh, the question is why it has been so difficult to get a vaccine for a for parasite. So the the answer has many reasons. Uh, the, the best example is with malaria. Uh, you can see, indeed, the current um, malaria uh, vaccine uh, have only 36% of efficacy. So how was possible that World Health Organization now is is uh, promoting his use for uh, in the in the malaria control programs. So uh, this vaccine needs four dose to give some protection in children. You can you go to look at the publicity about this vaccine by the World Health Organization to explain how this vaccine works within a control program. You can see that. Indeed, this vaccine is, is only a part of a, a group of measures that in, together have uh, the uh, protection for children. It's, it's only one part of different measures, so vaccine, bed nets, prophylaxis. So it's not the vaccine alone that get the, the reduction and, uh, and the efficacy for reduction in human malaria. So I want uh, to do justice for this story with one Colombian vaccine was proposed in the 1996 that have a near the same efficacy in human that the RTS. This is the SPS 26. It's a vaccine based on peptides and it was donated. It's not profitable. So uh, the World Health Organization can use also this vaccine uh, to be incorporated. And this was also proposed at that time for Pedro Alonso, that is the uh, uh, responsible for the program of uh, vaccine in the World Health Organization for malaria. And he, at that time, say that even a vaccine with a low efficacy can have a role to reduce uh, uh, the problem of malaria. And, but uh, maybe it's important also to see what the natural story of infection in human can tell us about how the, a vaccine can work. And uh, it's clear in the case of malaria that uh, in malaria we had a problem of partial immunity. So you can get reinfections even after a uh, um, um, first episode of malaria. And uh, so your immunity is, is not uh, sterilizing. So, but it's the contrary in, in toxoplasmosis. 
Here, this figure was drawn by uh, Dr. Jacob Frankel, was uh, um, also a research physician, research scientist that uh, uh, dis described the life cycle of toxoplasma. And he here described very well with uh, some picture from pathology, how is the problem of the immunity in the immunocompetent host and in one immunodeficient host. So in toxoplasm human toxoplasmosis, if you have a good immunity, you can get a, a protective immunity that uh, uh, can prevent new uh, uh, symptoms even after reinfection. So indeed, it's very rare to have a congenital infection after a mother has get a past infection. So that is very important because this is the basis for the uh, control of prenatal uh, uh, toxoplasmosis because our aim when we do a, a prenatal control program for toxoplasmosis is to identify the non-immunized woman. So, because we know that the problem, more important problem is with the primary infection during pregnancy. So it's a very different uh, situation that we have in the case of natural infection of uh, toxoplasmosis in humans compared to malaria. So now the second problem is how to prepare a vaccine. So uh, the first vaccine were developed by attenuating a strain of toxoplasma, but this can have the problem of reversion to, to a pathogenic phenotype. So the next possibility is to have a, a preparation of total uh, antigen as the vaccine and vaccine. Uh, and uh, here the problem is the production of a very standardized preparation of totally safe of parasites. But that is a very, very uh, uh, important strategy that can be used to immunize, to immunize uh, humans. Next, there are the possibility to do subunit vaccines. For that, we can use the recombinant the technology of protein, and also to use the DNA vaccines uh, or uh, to use bacterial vectors with uh, production of recombinant proteins, or even to use viral vectors in uh, producing a recombinant protein uh, derived from toxoplasma. So all these possibilities are, are, are possible. Uh, to, to do a vaccine for human toxoplasmosis. But uh, also it's important to know the, the, the correlations of protection in humans. So we know that it's very important to induce a specific CD8 cells, also to induce the CD4 uh, memory cells, of course, and all the forms of preparation of vaccine can do this. So uh, the problem now is to decide which to use. And, and uh, one of the most important work has been made to identifying uh, subunit vaccines uh, in the different stage of the parasites or in the tachyzoai or all size or bradyzoais. Uh, but we have to take into account that the, uh, the problem with toxoplasma is that uh, he used a redundant system uh, of, uh, in the case of surface proteins that uh, you can see here in this elegant experiment by Dr. Dubremes, he used a uh, knockout parasite for the MIG-1 or the MIG-3, and he showed that uh, to obtain a, a better control of uh, and survival of the mouse, it was uh, necessary to use a double knockout for each one of the micron and proteins. This is uh, earlier experiments that were made with the micron uh, But also it's the same, of course, with the sulfate-related uh, uh, proteins, uh, where we found the P30 protein, the major sulfate protein of toxoplasma. And you can see here, 
uh, also in this work by Michael Greek uh, team, that uh, he showed that to obtain a protection, a, a better an improvement in survival, is necessary to uh, do uh, a knockout of many of this, uh, the gene of these proteins to obtain a, a significant survival of the of mouse. So at the moment, we had a lot of work that has been made uh, with the different uh, uh, candidates, and it is possible to obtain uh, protection, at least in the, in the mouse model, with each one of these uh, proteins with, by using different strategies of protection. And, and I want to recall uh, our first essays uh, studying how to obtain a, a protection with uh, a PTRT protein and uh, in co uh, based on the uh, work of Dr. Patarroyo, who created the SPF 60C. Uh, in a first empirical approach, we tested uh, the, some, uh, all the uh, peptides that were derived for the, from the PTRT. And we found that uh, it's important uh, to obtain as an uh, production of antibodies and um, protection by using uh, the carboxy terminal uh, peptides. So this indicates that some region of the proteins can be very specific to obtain uh, a good protection in the, in the mouse model. But uh, Dr. Maleo has uh, did a, a very important work and uh, because we know that the peptides had many advantages because are cheaper to produce also, you can choose the type of immunogenicity or for T cells or B cells. You can combine also. But the problem is the uh, recognition of that peptide depends on the, of the genetic background of the host. So uh, that, is, that is the problem that was addressed by uh, Dr. Maleot with he, her uh, rational approach, she called this immunosense, and with this approach, he tried to identify the peptides that were recognized by different haplotypes. That is the most important problem uh, that we face when we use the peptides to induce immunity in humans. So uh, here is an example how you can achieve a protection by identifying peptides for the most uh, prevalent haplotypes that are present in human population. And with this uh, called super haplotype, you can uh, obtain a coverage of 90% of human population by choosing uh, the peptides that are recognized by those uh, haplotypes. So for that reason, uh, one of me a former student, now is a professor at the Universidad Antonio Nariño, Nestor Cardona, and he developed a pipeline of identification by using bioinformatics. And in this way, he identified novel peptides that were able to induce interferon gamma production by human lymphocytes. And, and this is uh, uh, something that is uh, very interesting because by using immune informatics, you can uh, speed the recognition of those haplotypes, of those peptides that can be recognized by a specific haplotypes. But another thing that is important to take into account when you are studying uh, the immunity and uh, looking for protective uh, preparation for uh, vaccine candidates is you have to take into account that the mouse is very different in the immune response uh, against toxoplasma. So we don't use the human, we don't use uh, the same uh, effector mechanism. For instance, uh, no, there are not any nitric oxide production during the human toxoplasma infection. And we use a very different effector pathways uh, and this is a very seminal important work that was uh, uh, launched by Dr. Jonathan Howard by identify, identifying that uh, the, the GVP proteins were essential 
to uh, uh, the effector mechanism uh, against oxoplasma. But in humans, we use a very different pathway uh, that had to be identified when we are studying uh, human cells. So for that reason, we developed this model. This model uh, used uh, a mo a peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Uh, uh, it's an, an ex vivo model that able to identify which uh, vaccine candidates can induce a protective immune response. And indeed, we have used this uh, model to identify a specific peptides within uh, a, a proteins of toxoplasma, different proteins. But at the same time, we were able with this model to identify how it's possible to immunomodulate the uh, human immune response in different clinical forms, in congenital, asymptomatic chronic infected people, or in ocular toxoplasmosis. And, and we found that it is possible to modulate at least in infected, congenital infected children by using some uh, um, specific peptides to, to change the, uh, the immune cytokines immune response. But also this uh, model indicate us that inocular toxoplasmosis is very difficult to change that uh, immune response. So here there are many work to do in order to identify which are happening in the uh, uh, immune uh, response in patients with ocular uh, toxoplasmosis. At the moment, we are uh, evaluating with uh, our ex vivo model uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, vaccine candidate from the vaccine ano uh, that uh, Dr. Fran Francois presented before me. And uh, here we examine this uh, uh, can vaccine candidate in the model of uh, peripheral human. Uh, um, mononuclear cells, and uh, we were able to, to identify uh, an induction of uh, the CD8 and uh, CD4 uh, specific immune cells, and also by using the uh, PVN cells from different serotypes. So this indicates that this vaccine is uh, able to induce a, a immune protective response uh, in people infected with different strains. So, so the next uh, 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 topic to be examined in the, in the case of uh, human uh, candidates uh, of vaccine is uh, also to, to think about which can be the, the, an appropriate vaccine candidate according uh, the population, because it's important to, to know that, uh, for instance, in pregnant women, uh, non-life uh, vaccine candidates should be preferred. And uh, it's the same in immunosuppressed people, but uh, um, for instance, uh, an attenuated strain can be possible to use in uh, pre-immune uh, uh, people, but an, another thing to, to think about is how to use the, that preparation to do immunomodulation. And this is some possibilities also uh, to, to explore. And also it's very important uh, to obtain uh, a preparation that can prevent uh, reactivation in people with ocular toxoplasmosis. That is one of the most important problems we had uh, uh, in, in this uh, population. So I uh, want to, in conclusion, yes, it is possible to have a vaccine. We have the tools. We have uh, very good uh, results from the uh, animal models. Also, we had an ex vivo model in human. So the question now is with those candidates, how we can prepare an, a human trial that is very uh, in origin to do uh, in, the, in the case of, for instance, of South American toxoplasmosis 
uh, is critical to have uh, a vaccine candidate for human uh, in the view of the problem we had uh, with uh, during pregnancy and also in people with ocular toxoplasmosis. So I want to thank all the people uh, and my team that made possible to, to present you all these results, in particular for uh, Alejandro Zamora, who did all the experiments in, uh, with the vaccine nano uh, vaccine candidate, and also Laura Lorena Garcia, that is now with Dr. Jensen in California doing his, her PhD. Uh, well, and thank you very much, uh, all of you, for your attention. And I uh, want uh, waiting for your questions and to discuss about uh, this topic. Uh, and hoping in the future we will be able to to share uh, to to test uh, vaccine for human. Thank you very much.